there are times when I'm asked the question, what's heaven going to be like? And sometimes that question is asked by, well, it sounds like it's going to be a little boring, just kind of standing around and singing, and I don't sing well here, and don't like to sing. And That moment you just experienced is just a, a minuscule glimpse of what heaven's going to be like. In that perfect moment, can you imagine eternity like that? Woo! That's just good stuff. That's stuff God gives us for free when He shows up. Thank you, Lord. One of the things we do as a congregation, 82 years strong, is that we believe, as we have, have we, as we have sung this morning, we believe in the power of Jesus Christ to save. And we believe that He has called us to share that message here where we live, here in our area, here in our state, here in our nation, and around the world. And so we do that in many variety of different ways. Acts 1-8 helps us to different, different things. On Friday night, a group was up at, uh, at Oxford, and they were sharing the gospel on the streets there at First Friday. We also have a group that is going to be going to Peru the 1st of July with a mission trip. And so we're taking time in worship every Sunday in June to pray for our team. So I'm going to ask them not to come forward, but if the team that's going, if you'll stand right where you are and stay standing so we can recognize you, those that are going, if you'll just stand, those that are here and, and can, these are the ones who will be going to Peru, remain standing, and we're going to pray together as a church for this team. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the calling of Christ to go to all the world and make disciples. I thank you for the preparation, Lord, and, and, and the way in which you have, have raised up your people to go, to pray, to support, to be a part of your great commission. I ask you to bless each one of these. Lord, there are a thousand other things they could be doing instead of going thousands of miles away to share Jesus. But Lord, thank you that we can hook up with churches and serve you and bring some help to them and with them. Lord, the churches are excited in Peru. So help us to share that excitement and to go. Bless these as they prepare. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can be seated. Happy birthday. If you haven't heard it yet today, you're asleep. But happy birthday today as we share together. Birthdays are celebrated as significant events. And we're all 82 years and going. Today, we are going to look at our standing stones. And all God's people... Yawned. Ugh. Doesn't sound exciting, does it? Our standing stones. But I think, I think that if you follow with me for a few moments, you'll see what God has to say to us. The Bible really doesn't record birthdays per se, but it does recognize significant events in special ways through the people and the stories in the Bible. One of those biblical ways of recognizing God's significance in people's lives and the lives of His people was through the use of standing stones. Now, stones were erected to remember God's provision, His faithfulness, and His presence. The very first usage of standing stone in the Bible that we, that we remember is the story of Jacob. You remember that Jacob had a brother named Esau. And Jacob and his brother didn't seem like they got along too well. And so when it came time for Isaac to give the birthright over to Esau, Jacob kind of worked with his mom and it didn't go well. So Esau claimed he was going to get his brother, so Jacob took off running. And as Jacob was running, he came to a place where he was very, very tired and he laid down and he took a stone for his pillow. Now right there, there's something wrong with that. I don't know why in the world someone would use a stone for a pillow, but he does. I used to say about my father, my father was a man who could sleep at any time, anywhere. He could sleep on a pile of rocks, it didn't matter, he'd just fall asleep. Maybe that was the way Jacob was, but he pulled this stone over, laid his head down on it, and he went to sleep. Now you know what happened, don't you? As he was sleeping, he had a dream. And he, he saw angels on a stairway going up and down, up and down to heaven. And, and as, he, as he had that dream, he saw God at the top of that, of that stairway, and he was given the blessing that God had given to Abraham. Listen to what it says in Genesis chapter 28. God said to Jacob, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. 
The land on which you lie I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. Jacob woke up, and this is what he said, Surely the Lord is in this place. So he took that stone and he stood it upright. He anointed oil on the top of it and said, This place is now known as Bethel. Now if you know a little bit of Hebrew, you know that the word Beth is the word for house. And El is the word for God. This is the house of God. By the way, a little New Testament, Bethlehem is the house of bread, where Jesus, the bread of life, was born. So we see here, Jacob erects a stone, the first, the first we know of, of him erecting a stone, and so everybody who would go by that place, would come by, would know that something significant happened here between Jacob and the Lord. Throughout the Old Testament, this setting up of standing stones was used by God's people to mark places where significant events took place as a reminder to everyone who saw the stone what had happened. In Exodus chapter 24, Moses is called of God to bring all of the people to the mountain of God. And when they get there, he, he erects 12 standing stones at the foot of the mountain, one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Then Moses goes up on the mountain, and what does he do? He receives the what? The Ten Commandments, and they're written on what? Stone, significant, permanent, God's presence. He comes down, and, and you know the whole story there, but they erected the 12 stones at the foot of the mountain to say this is a place where we've met God, where God's presence and God's promise is given to us. Over in Joshua chapter 4, when God entered, God's people entered the Holy Land after their long 40 years in the wilderness, they crossed over the river Jordan as God parted the waters. And listen to what happened. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan and carry them over with you to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, What do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So when they crossed into the promised land, they didn't just cross over and say, hey man, this is neat. They put 12 stones up so that every generation who would pass by that place would know that God showed up in that place and fulfilled his promise to his people. At the end of his life, Joshua gathered the people together. And you'll remember because in that, in that gathering of the people at the end of Joshua's life, he told them, he said, you know, you've got foreign gods around you. You've got a bad history around you. He said, but, but choose you this day whom you will serve. You remember the rest of that? Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But at the end of that, that whole passage in Joshua 24, listen to what it says. Then Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God. And he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak, which was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness for us, for it has heard all the words of the Lord which he spoke to us. It shall therefore be a witness to you, lest you deny your God. Joshua stood that stone and said, Every time you see this stone, remember that God has brought you to this place. God showed up and God gave you the promise that he has. There are other places in the Old Testament where we see the standing stones. In 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12, the prophet Samuel erected the Ebenezer stone, which is the stone of help because God had helped his people. In 2 Samuel 18, Absalom, the son of David, erected a stone to himself because he had no heir and it was not, did not go well for him in the land of Israel. Throughout the Bible, the standing stone was a significant event and a reminder of God's place and provision with his people. Now, that was the history lesson. This seems odd to us, doesn't it? I mean, we don't see standing stones around us. It's an old, odd, ancient practice. We just don't see those standing stones around us, do we? See, we erect stones for significant events, for remembering what the nation has done. But it also gets personal. You know, we have mile markers on the road because they come from milestones that's where the term comes from from the ancient romans set up milestones so they could tell how far they were moving along the mile 
We do it today. We have the metal signs. It's the same thing as a milestone. We also erect tombstones to say that someone significant has lived and died and their body is here. And so we remember that through the standing of a stone in someone's honor. Our Jewish friends have a custom where they'll place a stone when they visit the grave of someone. Now that, that's biblically significant because they're harking back to the time that they would, they would, they'll place a stone on a tombstone of someone they visit to say, I've been here and I remember. And here we remember someone who has passed away. And so we have very personal ways of, of erecting stones, standing stones, if you will, to remember what has happened in our own history. And we kind of do that in churches, don't we? Do we erect stones in our church? Well, we may have a cornerstone, a stone of significance that God has been in this place and God's people follow his provision. We do that through a cornerstone or we have our own stone outside here. It's a way that we erect a standing stone to say the Lord is in this place. Now, what's, what's interesting about that is that in biblical history, God abolished the standing stone. Over in Leviticus, he says, You shall make no graven image, nor stand up pillars of stone. He got rid of that practice because God was ushering up something better. Now, let's start the sermon. If you have your Bible, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Peter is, is writing a letter to the church here, to, to God's people. And he begins in verse 1 by saying, Therefore lay aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Then he says in verse 4, Coming to him, he's speaking of Jesus, as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. In this passage, and some others we'll look at in just a moment, Peter, filled through the Holy Spirit, reminds us that there is a standing stone today. That stone is not made of granite or limestone or sandstone or anything else. That is a living stone, and that living stone is Jesus Christ. Paul also wrote over in Ephesians uh, chapter 2, verses 19 through 22, he talks about Jesus as being that, that living stone, if you will. Listen as I, as I read that in Ephesians chapter 2. Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple of the Lord, in whom you are now being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Jesus here, Paul says, is the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone. Over in Matthew chapter 16, Peter called Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God, and then Peter sa or Jesus says to Peter, Peter, your confession is true, because upon this rock, this confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, I will build my church. There is so much standing stone imagery in the Bible that one theologian said Jesus was not only raised as a carpenter, he was probably raised also as a stonemason because of all that imagery that's there. As a builder, we see it throughout the Bible here. Jesus is the rock of God, the living standing stone for us to know and the presence and the promise of God. So the question for us this morning is, have you come to the rock? We used to sing a song, I go to the rock of my salvation. Remember that song? Have you come to the rock of your salvation? Over in our, in our focal passage, listen to what Peter says a little bit further down. Therefore it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame therefore to you who believe he is precious but to those who are disobedient the stone which the builder rejected has become the chief cornerstone and the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense they stumble being a disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed if you have not come to the rock you have stumbled 
And so he offers you to come and know the solid ground of Jesus. Now, I hear it all the time. I heard it this week. Pastor, we're living in the end times. Jesus has to be coming soon because, man, this world's just a mess. And we haven't even started getting all the commercials for the presidential election yet. It's just a mess. Because everything seems to be shifting. The morals and the values that most of us in this room grew up on have just been thrown out the window and everything is changing. The ground on which we stand is just shaking. And so today, Jesus says, come to the rock of your salvation. Come to the solid rock, the solid ground. And if you've not done that, he says, come today. Say, Jesus, I I may not understand it all, but I need some, some solid ground under my feet. I believe that you lived and died and rose for me. Come today and make that profession in your heart and in your life. But there's one more thing here, and don't miss this. In 1 Peter chapter 2, after verse 4, which says, Come to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. It says in verse 5, now don't miss this. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And then over in verse 9 it says, But you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into that marvelous light. Did you know that you are a rock? You are a precious stone, a living stone. The same word that Peter uses for Jesus as the living stone is used for you and I in Jesus Christ. We are living stones. Now, someone has said, yes, some of us are pretty hard-headed. That's not what we're talking about here. Remember what a standing stone was. What was it? It was erected that people would come by and point to that stone and say, God showed up in this place. So you and I, as God's chosen, as God's living standing stones, are that which people walk by us and say, hey, God showed up in that life. And to be a testimony with someone say, I want that solid rock in my life that I see in their life. That's what it means when we say we're going to be Jesus. That's what it means when we say we're going to share Jesus. That's what it means when we say we're going to love like Jesus because we are His standing stones that people look at and point to and say, God showed up there. God's promise lives in that person. You see, it's not in the buildings that we have, although it's beautiful. And on 82 years, we're grateful for what all God has done in this place to give us a facility to be able to to worship and to serve and to grow and to minister and party like it's 1969. I mean, this weekend's been back-to-back parties, and we're going to continue after Sunday school. God has blessed us with that. But the church is not, the building is not the living stone. God has given us many opportunities, but the stone that erected has our name on it is not who we are. It's us. His people, living as the witness of His presence and His promise to all of us in Jesus Christ. That's what it means when it says you are God's living stones. And so I would call us today, I would call us today to be His living standing stones in our families, at our job, where we go on vacation, the things that we do. Even when we're online, can we be his living stones? I've told you this story before. I have a friend who lives in Michigan, and on his computer led a woman to Christ who lived in Australia. Wow. That's technology to its best. A living stone. In everything we do, will we be his living stones? Many years ago, in south-central Kentucky, there was a shallow oil boom back in the 50s, and they found oil not too far under the surface, and so a lot of people made a lot of money very quickly. And the story is told, and we can take you to the place, but it's not there anymore, we can take you to the place where there stood a church. And on the church property, they found oil. Amen, hallelujah, let's drill. We can pay off the debt just like that. Well, this church found oil. So they started pumping oil, and they became very, very rich. And so it became a problem. People in the area started joining the church. 
I'm going to get in on this. And so the church had to decide what they were going to do. So as they got together and they, they had business meeting, they decided, well, so many people want to join us now because they want a piece of the action. We're going to close our membership. So they closed the membership of the church. What did I say at the beginning of this story? The church does not exist today. The church died because they failed to continue to be God's living stones in their community and worried only about themselves. Many a church fails and closes because God's people fail to be living, standing stones. Not the building, but the people of God. As we celebrate 82 years, we are the standing stones now. So who, who in your life needs to see a rock-solid follower of Jesus? Who in your life needs to, needs to have someone they can point to and say, that person, God has showed up in their life? Will you dedicate yourself to be the standing stones in their lives? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for 82 years as a church. And Lord, if, if you should tarry in your coming again, we look forward to at least 82 more. And in those years, Father, you have planted us in this place, on this hill. We often say to be a lighthouse. Father, remind us again what, what these words say, to be the standing stone of God in this place. That all who drive by say, here is a people where God shows up, where God's presence dwells, where God has given them a promise and they live that promise to the community. Oh, Lord, may we take that serious. And in this moment, Lord, as we, as we affirm together that we are here in this place, Lord, we will also see our privilege and responsibility to pray for our neighbors, to witness, to be Jesus, to share Him, with those around us, to be dedicated to your church, the living stones of God in this time, in this place. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand together, we're going to sing, Lord, here am I. You may stand. And this is your time to say, yes, Lord, I'm serious about being a person people can look at and say, here's where God shows up. This altar is open for you to come and to pray. If you'd like to know more about Jesus and, and, and Him being the living stone in your life, then come, I'll pray with you. If you want to say, Father, I'm following you. I want the world to know and be baptized at the end of this month, then come this morning. We'll talk together and we'll set that up. But as we sing, this is your time to be the standing stones of God. Let's sing together and let Him lead us. Master, Thou callest, I gladly obey. Only direct me, and I'll find Thy way. Teach me the mission appointed for me. What is my labor and where it shall be? Master, thou callest, and this I reply. Ready and willing, Lord, hear. We continue to sing, you may come. Willing my Savior to take up the cross Willing to suffer reproaches and loss Willing to follow if Thou wilt but lead Only support me with grace in my need. Master, thou callest, and this I reply, ready and willing, Lord, here am I. Once you
once again, before we close, happy birthday to you. How many of you, when you were growing up, either as a child or as a young person, went to camp? Wow, look at that. Majority of the congregation. Well, our youth are getting ready to go to camp, and some of you have said, well, I haven't had an opportunity to give. Well, during our luncheon, we're going to give you an opportunity. we have baskets out. You can give to help our kids go to camp and get everything done for that. It's just a way of us reminding and remembering what God has done in our lives. We want to see that happen for our next generation. So we'll do that during our lunchtime. Happy birthday. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that we can set, a time, set aside a special time when we're grateful for all you've done and all that you continue to do and will do. And Lord, let us be the living stones showing the world who Jesus is. And we thank you in his name. Amen.